And uh, today we look at uh, introduction to pharmacology in a series of our PowerPoint uh, uh, lessons in uh, pharmacology. Okay, so in uh, these series, uh, we'll look at uh, what we're going to term as pharmacology one and then uh, pharmacology two. The course uh, will start with the introduction of pharmacology and it will go on. Uh, to explain the history of pharmacology and also it will look at uh, the legal, ethical and uh, the cultural aspect of pharmacology. We will also look at the drugs acting on uh, different uh, systems of the body, their routes of administration, their mode of action, uh, side effects, the nursing implication as well as uh, drug interactions. Okay, so we we'll also look at drug uh, at drugs at the role they play in uh, prevention and treatment of ailment, okay, and also look at the, the effects of uh, the disease causing organisms and how the body utilizes it, the drugs. Okay, a sound knowledge of basic pharmacological principle is actually essential for the safety administration of medication and also monitoring of patients as they receive a medication. So the administration of drug is a fundamental responsibility of uh, the person who's giving the drug and uh, in the health cycle, we are looking at the nurse who is giving the drug. So that is why it is important that for the health practitioner or the nurse in this, uh, in this case, uh, to understand the basic concepts of administering drugs so that they can perform this task safely and accurately. In addition to administering the drug, uh, we also appreciate the best ways of monitoring therapeutic responses and report adverse reaction. What is the general objective for this lesson? The general objective is that at the end of uh, learning all the units within our PowerPoint service, uh, mostly our target uh, student nurses should be able to acquire the knowledge and understanding of our uh, introduction to pharmacology and understand uh, the basics that are needed for one to know as they practice their health uh, uh, programs or services. So for this lesson, we just want you to understand the basic introduction to pharmacology. The specific objective for this uh, lesson is that at the end, you should be able to state why nurses uh, should uh, study pharmacology, explain the history of uh, pharmacology, describe the principles of clinical pharmacology, explain the terminologies and abbreviations that are used in pharmacology. So why uh, should uh, nurses uh, study pharmacology? So out of the three people who deal with uh, patient drugs, and namely the doctor, the nurse, and pharmacist, it is actually the nurse who handles the drug in terms of storage, administration, and observation of its effect and side effects. So that emphasizes the importance because if the drug is not properly stored, it may lose its importance or it may lose its power to cure a disease. Okay, so since the nurse stays with the patient for 24 hours, they play a major role in ensuring that the doctor prescribes the right drug to the patient through, the, through accurate observation and recording. It is also important because uh, the study of pharmacology will help a nurse um, to know how certain drugs are administered and why they are administered in that way. Okay, you may also learn about the side effect of these drugs so that you may not end up treating side effects as an illness, but understand that certain effects that may be reported as signs and symptoms, they may come from the effect of drugs. So we learn about pharmacology in nursing so that we know which drugs are suitable 
so that we can counteract the side effect and we can also observe side effects in the patients. The other reason is also for the genesis uh, to know the case uh, of uh, medicine reaction as they are giving uh, these drugs. Also, how to identify symptoms of reactions or side effects or adverse reactions. Also, nurses learn about pharmacology so that they can appreciate the contraindication of certain drug to certain patients and in certain conditions. Okay, so other things as to why nurses learn about pharmacology is for them to know the correct dosage for a particular patient and also be able to assist okay, in prescribing the right dosage. Nurses learn about the pharmacology so that they can educate the patient and the client concerning the disease and also be able to um, be able to ascertain the queries that need classification concerning drug administration, side effect, and the drug mode of action. Okay, so the other reason as to why nurses learn about pharmacology so that there is a proper storage of the drug so that they don't lose their potency as they help in storing of the drugs. When we talk of vaccines, if you do not follow the cold chain, then the drugs tend to lose their potency on the way. With that discussed, now let us look at history of pharmacology. The word pharmacology is derived from the Greek word pharmakos, which means medicine or drug, and logos, which means study. It is a broad science that includes all aspects of the subject of chemical substances that act upon body cells. Pharmacology studies the effect of drug and how they exert their effect on the body. Practically, it is the study of drugs and how they act. As early as the 19th century or even, or even uh, before, the Egyptians, Arabs, and the Latin knew how to use medicines, though they were totally ignorant about uh, the discipline of pharmacology. The Egyptians used Siena for the treatment of constipation, and the Arabs used opium for the treatment of minor disorders, but both did not understand the effect of drugs until much later. Historically, synthetic organic chemistry was born in 1828 when Frederick Valla synthesized urea from inorganic substances and thus uh, demolished the, the vital force uh, theory, okay? So thus he came up uh, with the, the, the vital force uh, theory. The date of pharmacology is not as clear cut, but otherwise in the early 19th century, physiologists have performed many pharmacological studies. Okay, however, Oswald Schmendebeck that is 1838 to uh, 1921, is generally recognized as the founder of modern, uh, modern pharmacology. He obtained his medical doctorate in 1866 with the thesis on measurement of chloroform in blood. He worked at uh, Doppert and, uh, and uh, Bessin, succeeding him in 1869. In uh, 1872, he became professor of pharmacology at the University of uh, Strasbourg, receiving generous government support in the form of the magnificent, uh, magnificent Institute of uh, Pharmacology. In uh, 1869, Schmidberg showed that masculine evoked the same effect on the effect on the heart as electrical stimulation or the of the vagus nerve. Okay, so as you can note, there has been a great revolution from ancient to modern pharmacology. Hence, it's important, uh, it's, it's important uh, to acquire the knowledge in the pharmacology. Some terminologies that are used in pharmacology 
So we have general anesthesia drugs, general anesthetic drugs. So these are the medicines uh, that uh, depress the cerebral function by inducing unconsciousness. They are usually administered intravenously and others are through inhalation. Local anesthetic drugs, these are medicines that block the impulses of uh, sensory. Nail fibers producing instantly for pain on the area of administration, but do not interfere with uh, consciousness. They are usually administered through intradermal or subcutaneous route. Intrathecal anesthetic drugs, uh, these are local anesthetic drugs that are injected in the spinal column, usually at the lumbar region, to block sensory impulses below the lumbar region. They are commonly used for major operations, that is on the United system. They do not interfere with consciousness and are usually given together with major narcotic drugs like morphine. Uh, dialytics. These are drugs that increase the reabsorption of water by the renal tubules, thereby increasing the solute and its excretion, resulting in the increased amount of urine. They are usually described or named according to their action or side of action. Osmotic diuretics. These will increase urinary output volume, but will reduce loss of sodium or salt. The potassium sparing diuretics, these are diuretics that reduce the loss of potassium, but increase the loss of sodium and water. Steroids, the, uh, steroids so anti-inflammatory steroids, these suppress all the inflammatory process and also the generalized reaction of inflammation such as the pyrexia and the malaise. Therefore, they should be used with their caution because inflammation is the body's mode of dealing with pathogenic bacteria invasion. And if the inflammation is suppressed, the bacteria will spread to all parts of the body. That is when there is a low immunity and and the steroids may also reduce immunity. So inflammation is a normal body reaction to invading pathogens. As, a gluco, as a gluco, glucocorticoid, steroids are capable of stimulating the production of sugar from a protease in the body, thereby reducing sensitivity to insulin, and the, it will cause the patient to have a diabetes. As mineral corticoids, they cause retention of sodium and water leading to edema and the development of hypertension. Okay, so now the other uh, definition of our terms are in pharmacology that we can look at are tranquilizers. They are drugs that calm patients who are active or excited or maybe have some confusion or any common feature of that kind. Types include minor tranquilizer and major tranquilizers. Minor tranquilizers have a relaxing and tranquilizing effect in patients with the anxiety, tension, and fear. Major tranquilizers, on the other hand, are used in patients where uh, in a patient present with a severe symptoms of anxiety, tension, and especially where a state of confusion occurs. Antidepressors from depression, antidepressors. These are drugs that are used in the treatment of depression and illness that might occur as a result of unfortunate domestic and social condition. Emetics and antiemetics. Okay, so emetics are drugs that may be used to induce vomiting, whilst antiemetics are drugs that may reduce the age of vomiting. 
So diuretics, local anesthetic drugs and tranquilizers. So there we can say emetics are used uh, to provoke vomiting and are divided into two groups. We have reflex emetics and central emetics. These in uh, reflex emetics induce vomiting by irritating the stomach, e.g. warm salt, water, mustard, or teaspoon. That is, you can take water or mustard, one teaspoon to one pint of warm milk. Then when you, you talk of central emetics, these induce vomiting by irritating the vomiting center direct in the brain, like uh, apomorphine. Okay, apomorphine does not have an analgesic effect. Okay, so now we look at terminologies that are used like anti-emetics. These are drugs that are used to stop vomiting, like placing, antihistamines and histamines. So we have histamine, drugs that stimulate gastric secretion and cause vasodilatation of capillaries and arterioles. Then antihistamines, these are drugs that antagonize the action of histamine and most of them have some and emetic effects. Some antihistamine will cause it drowsy. Laxatives, pegatives, and apadines. These are drugs which loosen the bowels, thereby promoting evacuation as a result of a soft form too. They are commonly uh, abused drugs and are and are classified into three groups. Bulk pegatives. These include high residue foodstuffs, e.g. mangoes, emollient pegatives, and uh, irritant pegatives. Bulk pegatives, these include high residue foodstuffs, e.g. mangoes. Then emollient pegatives, these usually include oils like liquid or paraffin. Then irritant pegatives include uh, castor oil and fungal agents. These are drugs that are used in treatment of fungal infection and uh, most of them are typically applied, but few of them are systemic drugs. And hermetics are drugs that are used in treatment of worm infestations. There are uh, a diverse group of substances with uh, widely um, differing uh, properties. Antimalarial drugs. These are drugs that are used in treatment of malaria. They can be given orally, IM or IV. Vaccines and ansera. These are drugs that are given for protection against certain communicable diseases. They are divided into three categories. We have uh, toxoids, these are given to bring about active immunity and once given, the person produces antibodies against the bacteria or toxin. They are used mainly for prophylaxis and measures. Sera, these are preparations that are given in order to bring about a passive immunity and are usually given for treatment, e.g. tetanus toxoid at 0.5 mu, but it's given IM. Antigens, these are used for diagnostic purposes, anti tuberculosis drugs or anti TB drugs. These are drugs that are used in the treatment of TB. They are basically provided into two phases, namely intensive and continuation phase, which caters for both children and adults. Receptor mediated drug action. The function of a cell alters when a drug interacts with a receptor cell. A receptor is a specialized macromolecule or a large group of molecules linked together that attaches or binds to the drug molecule. This alters the function of the cell and produces the therapeutic response of the drug. For a drug receptor reaction to occur, a drug must be attracted to a particular receptor. 
drugs bind to a receptor much like a piece of a puzzle. The closer the shape, the better the fit, and the better the therapeutic response. The intensity of the drug response is related to how good the fit of the drug molecule is and the number of receptor sites occupied. Agonists. Agonists are drugs that bind with a receptor to produce a therapeutic response. Drugs that bind only partially to the receptor will most probably have some, although slight, but will have some therapeutic response. Antagonists. Antagonists are drugs that join with a receptor to prevent the action of an agonist. When the antagonist binds more tightly than the agonist to the receptor, the action of the antagonist becomes strong. Drugs that act as an antagonist produce no pharmacological effect. An example of an antagonist is Nekan, a narcotic antagonist that completely blocks the effect of morphine and reverses respiratory depression, so it is used as an antidote. This drug is useful in reversing the effect of narcotic overdose. Receptor-mediated drug effects. The number of available receptor sites influences the effect of the drug. If only a few receptor sites are occupied, although many sites are available, the response will be minimal. If the drug dose is increased, more receptor sites are used and the response increases. If only a few receptor sites are available, the response does not increase, even the dose is increased. However, not all receptors on a cell needs to be occupied for a drug to be effective. Some extremely potent drugs are effective even when the drug occupies a few receptors. Half-life. This refers to the time required for the body to eliminate 50% of the drug. Knowledge of half-life of a drug is important in planning the frequency of dosing. For example, drugs with a short half-life, that is two to four hours, need to be administered frequently, whilst a drug with a long half-life, like 21 to 24 hours, requires less frequent dosing. Although half-life is fairly stable, Patients with liver or kidney disease may have problems excreting the drug. Difficulties in excreting a drug increases the half-life and increases the risk of toxicity. For example, digoxin or lanoxin has a long half-life of about six hours and requires once daily dosing. However, Aspirin has a short half-life and requires a frequent dosing. Older patients or patients with impaired kidney or liver function may require frequent diagnostic tests measured in renal or hepatic function. Okay, so now with that discussed on the terminologies that are used in pharmacology, let us also appreciate abbreviations that are used in pharmacology. Abbreviations are related to frequency of drug administration, although they are internationally accepted, you are not allowed to use them in your examination of oral or written. You are only allowed to use them on the drug charts. So we have abbreviations like AC to mean before meals and the SABA, PC after meals. AD, right ear, AS, left ear, ALL, both ears, HS, hour of sleep, IM, intramuscular, 
IV intravenous in whole, that is I N H A L for inhalation, I T intrathecal inhalation, drugs that you have to inhale intrathecal, drugs given in the spine, I and O, that is intake and output, that drops, GM grams, I, that is L liters, MG my milligrams, OD once a day, O, right I. Okay, so we also have others like OS, PO, the oral, common boost, uh, Pura N, repeat when necessary, QH every hour, QWK every week, QOD every other day. Okay, so these are just some of the many abbreviations that are used in pharmacology. Okay, and uh, subconj, subconj, tiber, SC, subcutaneously, T T H S a teaspoon, a T A B, or tab, that is for tablets. So these are just some of all the abbreviations that are used. Okay, so when it comes uh, to this, we also have PR, per rectum, and then we have ML, beta, T I D, three times a day, P I D. Uh, that is a brought in dead. Okay, BD twice a daily, QID every six hours in a day or four times a day, Nocte at night. Let us now look at principles of clinical pharmacology. The following are the principles of pharmacology which you need to know very well. In the principles of pharmacology, we talk about the nature of the drug, pharmacotherapeutics, pharmacodynamics. So we have pharmacovigilance, pharmacokinetics, prescribing and rational drug use, placebo, adverse drug reaction, neonatal, pediatric, and diuretic consideration in drug administration as some of the principles in clinical pharmacology. Okay, so now let us talk about the nature of the drug. The drug may be solid at room temperature, e.g. paracetamol, or liquid, okay, for instance, nicotine. These factors determine the best route of wound administration. You should also be aware of the different representation of drugs in relation to drug size as it varies from 100 milligrams to 1000 milligrams. You will also learn about drug reactivity at, at drug receptors. Drug interact at receptors by means of chemical bonds, e.g. covariant, electrostatic, and hydrostatic. You are aware that molecules have different shapes, hence drug molecules must be as such to permit binding to its receptor site, optimally when drug shape is complementary to a lock. Pharmacotherapeutics. This is the scientific study of the use of drugs in the treatment of disease. So in this lesson, you are aged to know the therapeutic effect of one agent as compared with those of another on the basis of ability to halt a disease or disease process. Pharmacodynamics. This is the study of the biochemical and physiological effect of drugs and their mechanism of action. Most drugs bind to receptors to bring about their effect. Pharmacodynamics, necessarily looking at the effect of the drug on the tissue, body, or on the receptor. When drugs bind to these receptors, there is a cascade of chemical reaction that follows in order for it to achieve the effect in a specified duration. However, you should be aware that all drugs produce more than one effect in the body. The primary effect of a drug is the desired or therapeutic effect. Secondary effects are all other effects, whether desirable or undesirable produced by the drug. 
most drugs have an affinity an affinity more like a craving affinity for certain organs or tissues and exert their greatest action at the cellular level on those specific areas which are called the target sites you are you, you are or you will discover that there are two many mechanism action and these are alteration in cellular environment or alteration in cellular function alteration in cellular environment some drugs act on the body by changing the cellular environment either physically or chemically physical changes in the cellular environment include changes in osmotic pressure duplication absorption or the condition on the surface of the cell membrane an example of a drug that changes osmotic pressure is a manitol which produces a change in the osmotic pressure in the brain cells causing a reduction in the cerebral edema alteration in cellular function most drugs act on the body by altering cellular function. A drug cannot completely change the function of the cell, but it can alter its function. A drug that alters cellular function can increase or decrease a certain physiological function, such as increase in heart rate, decrease blood pressure, or increase urinary output. Pharmacognos. This is the study of drugs that are derived from herbal or other natural sources. Pharmacovigilance. This is defined as the science and activities relating to the detection, assessment, understanding, and prevention of adverse effects of any other, of any other drug related. Pharmaco from pharmacology. Vigilance, vigilant team, vigilant. The aims of pharmacovigilance are to enhance a patient's care and patient safety in relation to the use of medicines and to support public health programs by providing reliable, balanced information for the effective assessment of the risk benefit profile of medicine. You are required to observe the patient for any unwanted effect after giving the drugs to enhance pharmacovigilance. Pharmacokinetic. Pharmacokinetic refers to activities within the body after a drug is administered or what the body does to the drug. These activities include absorption, distribution, metabolism, and excretion. This means that you have to know the half-life of the administered drug for you to avoid giving an overdose. Another pharmacokinetic component is the half-life of the drug. Half-life is a measure of the rate at which drugs are removed from the body, hence the study will make one focus on the action of the drugs, their absorption, distribution, bowel transformation, and excretion absorption this is the process by which a substance enters the blood circulation or is the process by which a drug is made available for use in the body it occurs after dissolution of the solid form of the drug or after the administration of a liquid or parental drug in this process the drug particles within the gastrointestinal tract are moved into the body fluids. This movement can be accomplished in several ways, namely active absorption, passive absorption, and the pinocytosis. In active absorption, a carrier molecule such as a protein or enzyme actively moves the drug across the membrane. Then in passive absorption, it occurs by diffusion. There will be movement from a higher concentration to a lower concentration. In pinocytosis, 
cells engulf the drug particle, causing movement across the cell. Distribution. This is the dissipation of um, dissemination of substance throughout the fluids and tissues of the body. The systemic circulation distributes drugs to various body tissues or target sites. Drugs interact with a specific receptors during a distribution. Some drugs may even travel by binding to protein or albumin in the blood. Drugs bound to proteins are pharmacologically inactive. Only when the protein molecule deletes the drug can the drug diffuse into the tissues, interact with the receptors, and produce their therapeutic effect. Metabolism. This is the process by which complex molecules are broken down into simple molecules. Metabolism is also called a bowel transformation as this is the process by which a drug is converted by the liver to inactive compounds through a series of chemical reactions. Patients with the liver disease may require lower dosages of a drug detoxified by the liver or the primary care provider may select a drug that does not undergo a bowel transformation by the liver. Excretion. This is the removal of the substance from the body. The elimination of drug from the body is what we call excretion. After the liver renders the drug inactive, the kidney excretes the inactive compound from the body. Some drugs are excreted and changed by the kidney without liver involvement. Patients with kidney disease may require a dosage reduction and careful monitoring of kidney function. Children have immature kidney function and may require dosage reduction and kidney function tests. Similarly, older adults have a diminished kidney function and require careful monitoring and lower dosages. Other drugs are eliminated through sweat, breast milk, breath, or by the gastrointestinal tract in feces. Let us now also look at another principle which is prescribing and rational drug use. Prescribing is the power given to the doctor or health practitioner after qualifying so that they become prescribers. So a prescription can be written on paper as long as all necessary legal elements are present. However, you will not always work where there are doctors, hence you are also equipped with knowledge as a nurse to prescribe and use drugs in a rational way. Your prescription should be readable and signed clearly for optimal communication between and other between and other health care members like pharmacists and other uh, nurses that may look at it. So it must be legible. Your prescription should contain sufficient information to permit a pharmacist or a nurse to discover possible errors before the drug is dispensed or administered. So in order to have a rational drug use, your prescription should include patient's name, name of the drug, dose of the drug, route, frequency to take the drug, starting date, and sometimes discontinued date. Then there should be the prescriber's signature rational drug use. This is uh, to do with uh, the prescriber's judgment of correct drug to be used. Okay, correct drug to be used to avoid waste with right prescription and right diagnosis. 
you are required to do this in order to achieve a good prescribing, dispensing, and compliance in all treatment at lowest possible cost. Okay, so this also enables you to ensure rational use of drugs, okay, as a measurable indicators on how well you are using the drugs, that there is no wastage. So, rational use of drug also will help you to ensure that all access to drug is accompanied by adequate information necessary for rational drug use. Rational drug use also helps to eradicate unnecessary and inappropriate drug use at all levels in the society. Placebo. A placebo is a substance containing no medication and is prescribed or given to reinforce a patient's expectation to get well. It is also defined as an inactive substance or preparation that is used to control uh, that is used as a control in an experiment or test to determine the effectiveness of a drug. A placebo is intended to deceive the recipient. Sometimes patients are given a placebo treatment who have perceived or an actual improvement in a medical condition, a phenomenon commonly called the placebo effect. Placebos are widely used in medical research and are given as control treatment and depend on the use of uh, measured deception. However, the use of placebos as treatment in clinical medicine, as opposed to laboratory research, is ethically problematic as it introduces a deception and dishonest into the doctor or nurse patient relationship. This means that you have to use placebos only on non life threatening situations. For example, you can give a patient who is complaining of severe pain just after receiving betadine injection to leave pain, maybe given after for injection to calm him or her adverse drug reaction. This is an unpredictable reaction of the drug to the body that are not the reason for which the drug was given for. Although some drugs are known to cause certain adverse reaction in many patients, so when we say adverse drug reaction, we are necessarily looking at unpredictable reaction of the drug for which it is not intended for. Example given is that drugs that are used in treatment of cancer are very toxic and are known to produce adverse reaction in many patients receiving them. There are usually harmful effects which you must watch out for and you are required to take prompt measures if detected. They can happen because the patient is allergic to the drug, or the dose is too large, too, uh, is too large for the patient. And other reasons could be several drugs are combination in the body when taken together, ah, they may produce a harmful effect. Other ways in which it can happen because the drug is not taken as prescribed by the health practitioner. Or it can be that inherently the drug has an harmful action. Let us look at neonatal, pediatric, and geriatric uh, consideration in drug administration. Drug doses uh, prescribed for children are calculated in terms of body weight and not by age. We talked in one of our lessons, okay, when we introduced uh, in another series of pharmacology about the use of drug formula and young formula. So I would really advise that you also look at that lesson. So drugs are given by KG body weight and not by age. This is so because children of any age may vary in weight. Therefore, we should all should at all times have working asset of scales in all clinics, wards, hospitals, where children are treated to avoid administering wrong doses. 
When you are prescribing or administering drugs to the neonate in pediatrics and in geriatrics, you need to consider the following. Age. The younger a patient is, the smaller the dose. Children are usually given smaller doses than adults. The very elderly also should have smaller doses. And by elderly, we mean those above 60 years or those above 65 years because of the decrease in function of the liver and the kidneys. Weight. The lesser the weight, the smaller the dose. Route. The dose is not necessarily the same for all routes. Larger doses are often given orally. Severity of the condition or disease. The more serious the condition is, often a larger dose will be ordered. Initial dose. This is the first dose. Sometimes this is much larger than the following doses. This is done so that a larger amount of the medicine gets into the bloodstream to fight the organism, for example, as with the antibiotics. Six. In females, certain drugs are considered in their dosage, especially in pregnant mothers or breastfeeding mothers. If higher doses are given, they can be harmful or toxic or can be teratogenic to the unborn fetus. Time of administration. This depends on the frequency and time, whether after meals or before meals. Drug interaction and dependence. Drugs have several ways in which they interact and depend on each other. You should therefore learn how drugs interact with each other or with food and before, given, before they take food. Certain drugs have instructions as to be given either with food or before food because if a drug that is supposed to be given before food is given after food, it will affect its absorption. Two or more drugs administered simultaneously or sequentially may either act independently of each other or may interact to augment or diminish the expected response or to cause an unexpected act. Toxicity. For instance, someone takes a magnesium and then takes a tetracycline. It is, forms a crystal ball in the mouth. The tetracycline will not be absorbed. The following are some of the common actions in which they interact or depend on each other. Synergism, potentiation, additive effect. The words imply that drugs can work together, but in different ways. Certain drugs may produce the same general effect when given together, or may produce an exaggerated effect out of proportion to the amount of each drug. So there can be a synergistic effect, a potentiating effect, an additive effect, or it can even be a subtractive effect. So such drugs are used, uh, so such drugs are said to be synergists. When you administer two drugs together and one intensifies the action of the other by the same mechanism of action, it is said to potentiate the other. So when uh, Certain drugs are meant to produce the same general effect when given together or produce an exaggerated effect out of proportion, multiplier effect out of proportion of each given. That is called a synergist. But when one drug is administered, or let's say when one drug is administered with the other, or two drugs are administered together, and one intensifies the action of the other by the same mechanism of action, we say that has potentiated the effect of the other. So that is what we call potentiating the effect. It has, it has improved the potential effect. It has enhanced in other language. When half a dose or a drug and another half 
of a similar acting drug are given to produce the full effect of the drug, they are said to have an additive effect. So half of the drug and another half of the drug, when given together, instead of producing uh, the expected half a pot a potential, then they produce the double potential, then in that drug will be said to have an additive effect. In summary, this unit you have learned about the history of pharmacology, the principles of clinical pharmacology, the common terminologies that are used in pharmacology. And I hope this session has prepared you to open your mind and uh, be able to administer drug completely without endangering the patient's life. Okay, so we are going to come again with another unit uh, where we will look at other, other drugs and uh, the legal matters that are involved in drug administration. Thank you and uh, keep your studying.